This is uh, David. And exactly nine years ago, yesterday, a gymnastic accident contused his spinal cord, leaving him paralyzed from the neck down. But let's listen to him telling you about this special day. This is the accident. I personally met David one year later. At the time, I was a young neuroscientist struggling to develop a treatment for spinal cord injury. A 10 years journey that I will summarize in one video. So this is a model of spinal cord injury. The rat has a very severe contusion that replicates what you would observe in humans. And although the region of the spinal cord that normally control leg muscle is intact, because it is disconnected from the brain, the animal is completely paralyzed. When the animal brain sends a command down the spinal cord, what you see is that the signal is interrupted. However, if we visualize in the spinal cord region, you can see that there are always some nerve connections that are intact, anatomically spared, but functionally they are silent. This means that the muscles are also dormant, and the region that controls leg muscle is also inactive. So to reactivate the spinal cord, we apply electrical stimulation. That will have two effects. First, it will reactivate the dormant spinal cord, so the animal will immediately start walking. But it will also enable this residual fiber to become functional. Now we approach a delicious piece of Swiss chocolate, and you see that the rat gets excited. The brain is interacting with the spinal cord in a way that the animal will actually jump. If we remove the chocolate, the animal will get frustrated. So she will actually completely block this automated locomotion. This means that we restore the communication, really, between the brain and the spinal cord below the injury. And it was quite an incredible achievement, but I was also very much aware of the challenge the gap to go from the sophisticated environment of the laboratory and rats to an intervention that may help David and others to regain some function. I knew that I needed a partner, a neurosurgeon, to help me in this endeavor. And this is when I met Jocelyn. I remember very well seven years ago when I met you, Grégoire. He was a very enthusiastic scientist with full of ideas. Tomorrow I would like to do it in humans. But we had to face a few challenges. Indeed. And one of them was the implantable device, because we needed to work with devices that were medically approved. And there were no medically approved devices done for this therapy. So we had to adapt existing devices that we normally use to stimulate the spinal cord to treat pain and to change them. So for that, we collaborated with Medtronic, and they allowed us to crack their mini computer this pacemaker that we implant in the belly of the patients in order to apply our algorithm to do the therapy. And another thing that was very important, we worked with electrodes that I had implanted on the spinal cord. And the, electrode, the existing ele electrodes were a bit short. So we had to find out the best way to position this electrode in order to be efficient. So for that, I had the help of a few guys in his team, the engineers, very helpful, who helped me to modelize the spinal cord of David in order to really understand where the different roots were located for me to be as precise as possible in order to make this therapy successful. October 2016, we were ready. So David was sleeping in the operating room. I hadn't slept so much the previous night. <laughs> But the rest of the team was quiet and ready, everybody with its mission. So on one side, the medical team, on the other side, the engineers, and together, checking the position of the electrode during the surgery, it worked well, it was a success. But... That's just the beginning, right? <laughs> that was just the beginning, indeed. 
then we had to see if it worked. And the first step is what we call the mapping. The mapping is to see if you can activate each joint separately and well. And here you have the example of a candidate who is completely paralyzed. He cannot move both legs. And here you asked him to extend his knee. And of course, he's not able to do it. And now you stimulate the very area, the very precise area that is supposed to help him extending the knee. And you see here that when he doesn't want to do it, he may feel some contractions, but nothing happens. But at the very moment he decides to do the movement and to stretch the, the leg, he's able to do with this the stimulation. So again, the same as Gregoire said in the rat, there is a kind of reconnection between the brain and the spinal cord that is helped with the stimulation, the electrical stimulation, but the patient always have to want to do it. But this is only one joint. Now imagine you want to walk. You need to coordinate the activity of many, many different joints. So for this, what we have to do is really deliver bursts of electrical stimulation that are very precise in space and time in order to synchronize the stimulation with the intended movement, and really with the precision of a Swiss chronometer. And this is how it looks like. So this is now David at the beginning of his training with the implant. Stimulation on means it is turned on. When it's turned off with the gravity, you see he cannot walk. Back on, and using his own term, his brain is reconnected with the spinal cord below the injury. And it's really important to understand here that we don't want to induce walking. We enable the brain to control the paralyzed muscle. And you will see this in this next video. Here you see that zero means David cannot activate single muscle of his left leg. We ask him to make small step and then make very exaggerated step without increasing the intensity of the stimulation. And you can see that this residual fiber that were non-functional, not only they activate the paralyzed muscle, but they enable him to even have a graded control over the activity of this muscle. That was impressive, Jocelyn, wasn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely impressive, but you have to be honest. It was not that easy at the beginning, and I remember very well these days where the engineer was struggling with the computer, thinking, how, how can I debug the problem and the system? Listen to David. You know, it's all amateurs here. They're just trying some stuff. They have no clue what they're doing. <laughs> but they look very intelligent because they're computers, you know. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was difficult and long, and we can thank David to have contributed to help us. But eventually, it really, really worked. And David could train intensively, not automatically in an exoskeleton, but really putting all his willpower in activating this otherwise paralyzed muscle. And then what happened, Jocelyn? Mm -hmm. I remember because I visited him sometimes, and you saw that by, with the training, he improved, he was stronger. But one day, I remember it was about two months after the beginning of the training, he came with a little surprise. And don't forget that David was completely paralyzed of the left leg. Ready? So Gonzalo asked me how long I slept last night. I said six hours, but it was five. Because I woke up and uh, checked the toes on the left. Pour la première fois, il est capable de bouger légèrement sa jambe paralysée. For the first time, he's able to move his left leg without stimulation. Two and a half hours. And it still works. It even worked more before. Yep, maybe some plasticity, huh? Yeah? <laughs> Let's see. Wow. Yep. Wow. And this was the beginning. Oh, wow. David continued training, and then from this wingling of the toe, started moving every single joint of the leg, and eventually was able to perform a few steps without stimulation, even without body weight support, but still needing the parallel bar to maintain the balance. Really, a neurological recovery that we were not anticipating. And I mean, how to explain this, Jocelyn? The only way to explain it is that is exactly the same that we demonstrate in, in the animals, is that there is a fiber nerves regrowth and reconnection, and this we call plasticity. But I must say that after six months of training, David was still improving, and it was hard to 
to stop here the, the, the study, and he wanted to keep using the device outside from the laboratory. So for that, we needed to find a solution. And here we have the engineers. <laughs> so what we did is kind of a proof of concept. We built a system to enable to control the stimulation outside the laboratory. So there is a little patient programmer that you see here to control the stimulation. And you can activate it with a remote control or even with a watch that responds uniquely to his voice. And this stimulator can really provide this complex spatiotemporal stimulation pattern to enable working in ecological settings. Stim on. OK, start message sent to implant. You may be wondering, is paralysis the next wall to fall? And the truth is that we don't know. We have a lot of work to do. But I would like to invite David on stage to tell you about it. Him off. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me here and for this warm welcome. Uh, I'm a bit overwhelmed now. Still. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, well, we heard a lot about falling walls and. Uh, in the last years, there were several falls for, walls for me falling. I'm a physical education teacher, and I teach at a normal school, and that was really something for me. A special moment to yeah, get in front of the students, see them doing sports, and me not being able to do it the same way. I'm playing wheelchair rugby, though, in the Swiss national team, so that keeps me busy as well. Another thing is I started kite surfing, one of the first quadriplegics to do it and also wakeboarding, of course. That was the warm-up. And one of the greatest walls that fell in the past was uh, due to these two people and the whole team that enabled me to do what the doctors said I would not be able to do again, walking, more or less. Um, exactly today, nine years ago, I woke up after several hours of, a, of operation. I couldn't even properly move my head. I tried to look down. People were touching me, asking, do you feel this? Do you feel that? Can you move this? Can you move that? I couldn't even move my arms. Um, yeah, that was hard. And for another seven months, I was in rehab. And after that, I continued. Went there four times a week, afterwards three. To, and in the end, I stopped it because we just didn't see any, any more progress. And then in 2016, Grégoire called me. It's like, well, we're ready to start the experiments. Are you there? And I was playing the European Championship, so I had to postpone it a little bit. <laughs> but uh, right after we started, and I, I liked the picture that I saw when I was still strong. Uh, I'm not that strong anymore, but there's a good reason for it. I'm training at home. I'm still playing rugby, but less, because I tried to get these legs moving more. And there was a crowdfunding. Let me check the time. Sorry for that. <laughs> um, there was this crowdfunding, and I got a treadmill. 
at my place and the body weight support system. And I'm still training. I try to train two, three times a week. And let's see where, where we go with this. And I said it many years ago, you've got to try to do the impossible to make the possible possible. And I'm really curious if there is another wall that might fall in this field. Thank you. <laughs>